Am I in the right place? If you are my seven o'clock, then close enough. <sighs> what are you writing? Do you always travel with the stuffed animal? N no. Hmm. Welcome to our first session. How are you feeling? Well, to be honest, I'm, uh, I'm a little nervous. You know, I never really... Before we begin, please turn your phone to airplane mode, or better off. They interfere with our sessions. Now, before we begin, I just want you to know that I am here to help you. But from time to time, I may need to confer with my colleagues. Allow me to introduce them. Please, Please welcome, welcome our 2022 speakers. speakers. All that for little old me? You're not that little. But your emotions do seem to be in the driver's seat. Why don't we unpack that? Let me zoom you in with my colleague, Cole Brown. Big data with predictive analytics, high performance computing systems, machine learning, and other strategies have been used in the past and will continue to be used heavily in the future of computational physics. By using these big data related systems, scientists and engineers have been able to more easily design cars, airplanes, and other vehicles. They've also been able to more accurately predict daily weather as well as natural disasters. Big data analytics has affected the field of computational physics almost since computational physics was created. Computational <laughs> physics will continue to improve the quality of everyday life. Confuse? Let me try again. Computers make our lives easier. Big data, which is essentially the crunching of huge numbers, allows engineers and scientists to improve our lives. Our cars are safer, our shopping is simpler, and our technology is faster and more powerful than ever. Even our weather forecasts are perfect, and make no mistakes. <laughs> yes, computers make our lives easier. If I were trying to convince you that computational physics was important, which of these two pitches was more convincing? The first one? The second one? Most of you seem to say the second one, which makes a lot of sense. The first pitch was essentially data, raw, unadulterated data. The second one was most of that information, minus a whole lot of vocabulary, with a lot of icing and sprinkles on top to make it sound good. The first was logic, the second was emotion, which leads to a question. Which is more compelling, the facts and the logic, or the feelings and the emotions? I remember a time, long ago, when I was sitting at the dinner table. The cheesy warmth of lasagna wafted from my plate up to my nostrils. The garlic bread, that hot, crisp, toasted goodness of the gods, <laughs> was to my left. As amazing as this offering was, I consumed it with a sense of dread trying to avoid the section on my plate on which had been placed broccoli. <laughs> broccoli. What type of sadistic goblin would force their child to eat a veritable forest of droopy micro bonsai trees? <laughs> and that rotten foot smell. <laughs> Mom, do I have to eat this? Yes, it's very good for you. It will make you big and strong. I wasn't swayed. Someday you'll thank me. Ten minutes later, I was still unmoved by her appeals to my rational self. And she changed her tack. Eat, or you don't get dessert. How could I resist the threat of no dessert? My happiness depended on that ice cream waiting in the freezer. Fine, I surrender. Back then, my six-year-old brain didn't care about the logical sense of eating vegetables. Who cared about the benefits to come when I was miserable now? As children, we're convinced almost entirely through emotion, without any regard to actual information. But all that changes once we become adults, right? Once we turn 21, it's all the data that's important. You'd never be swayed by your feelings, not when important, accurate information is available. You're basically robots. 
input, analyze, output. <laughs> Not quite. Even as we get older, logic doesn't completely take over our lives. That's the role of machines. A robot is pure logic. It takes in information, it analyzes that information, and then it makes an informed logical decision based on that data. It operates without any regard to pity, generosity, mercy, thoughtfulness, caring. None of these things can be comprehended by a machine. Is that what a human's like? No. We sit on our couches, screaming at a bunch of strangers to run faster, jump higher, catch that stupid ball. Are you blind, ref? Come on! <laughs> Don't judge. Some of you watch The Bachelor. <laughs> We are not robots, so while logic is important, it shouldn't govern our lives. Computational physics will continue to get better, and someday soon, computers will be better than humans at basically every logic-based task. But that's okay, because it's the emotional side of us, our ability to feel, to care, to connect, that makes us who we are. The logic and emotion, or logic and information that we apply as a tool to express those emotions is important, but in the end, we're all humans all emotional. Let's make sure to remember that. Thank you. Wow. We uh, really just jumped in there. That's how this works. I mean, I don't even know your name. I was just getting to that. I am Dr. Clarity. Clarity what? That's it. Oh. I'm just going to call you Doc. Would you consider yourself a type A? I'm A type. Hmm. <laughs> Let's do a deep dive. But, I can't swim, Doc. <laughs> Literal. And yet, the bathrobe. Well, I, I believe in being prepared. My colleague, Alamine Adjabade, can float you a life preserver. So, I was recently, I was recently told I was two thirds of the way through high school. How is that possible? I mean, yesterday, I was just in Mr. Irma's office he was telling me about orientation. Now, you're telling me in a year or so, I'll walk across that stage, shake his hands, and move on? I'm not ready. I mean, aren't we supposed to get a switch? You know, the switch, where I start to think and act more like an adult. <laughs> when do I get my switch? Next week? Next month, did my peers already get their switch? Is mine delayed? <laughs> and whose idea was it that after four years, I get on an airplane and I fly halfway across the country to live with a complete stranger in a world where I would have to wake up by myself? <laughs> a world where I would have to make a dentist appointment? If you ask me, that sounds like a page out of the books of don'ts. <laughs> I hope they realize I'm not ready to step into a world where my black skin threatens people. A world where people make negative assumptions without even speaking a word to me just because of the way my hair is dreaded. <sighs> a world that butches my name then writes me off. These were all the thoughts that were going through my head until a few weeks ago. How does learning the difference between normal and alkaline earth metals and the rules of Batman prepare me for a world where a Muslim's girl's job threatens people? Maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe I'm more prepared than I think I am. I mean, there have been thousands of ANC alums and most of them figured out how to make dentist appointments. <laughs> I can figure it out too. It took me some time, but I'm starting to realize, sadly, there is no adult switch. 
there won't be a day that I wake up and I start watching the news. <laughs> there may not be a day that I wake up and start purchasing a Sunday paper. There definitely won't be a day that I wake up and realize why we have to be at the airport four hours early. <laughs> but does that mean I'm so ill-prepared to enter the world? I'm starting to see that ANC has taught me how to tackle this big, scary world, how to prioritize things, to manage my time, how to interact with people of different backgrounds and cultures. Lurking behind all the lessons and shuttlecocks, <laughs> ANC has taught me the fundamentals of how to be a decent adult, how to be an upstanding adult, a prepared member of society, a mature and rounded human being. But has it taught me how to tackle the world as a young black man? How to now walk into a job interview and be automatically disqualified because of the way my hair is dreaded? But what they really mean is the color of my skin. This one took a little longer to find, right, find out the right answer to. I was in the car with my dad. I told him how, yeah, NAC has taught me how to be a pretty decent adult, but not a black adult. See, my dad has this thing where he knows I'm wrong, but he lets me keep speaking. <laughs> so I, I, I go on, on and on about, yeah, how, like, he looks at me, he goes, you're wrong. He told me that hey, he has helped me with that too, just not in the way that I think I am. He explained that every single day that I walk into ANC, it prepares me for the world as a young black man. In a few years, my classmates and I will own the biggest businesses who will all be CEOs. And guess what? Those white people are my friends. My dad said every single day that I walk into ANC and allow people to know me as Alameen, I'm making the world a slightly better place for the next kid with crazy unprofessional hair. <laughs> In a few years, that kid, he's going to walk into my office or my friend's office. And guess what? We know that his hair, the color of his skin, doesn't tell a fraction of his story or who he is or what he stands for. There is more to all of us. I mean, when that big UPS box arrives, I know you don't care what the box looks like. <laughs> You're more worried about what's on the inside. Should people be so different? I mean, what can Brown do for you? <laughs> it, it turns out I was completely wrong. I'm more prepared than I think I am. Somebody get me a cap and a gown. <laughs> I remember, I need an extra large for my big, crazy, unprofessional hair. I'll take care of the dentist. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Helpful, or are you still feeling a bit adrift? Well, it's not that I'm adrift. I just, I'm just not happy. Go on. I don't clap along. I don't feel like a room without a roof. You're not happy. I don't know that happiness is the truth. So you're not happy. I don't know what happiness means to me. Let's build on that and conference in Scarlett Smith. Happiness does not have to be buying that new car, winning an award, or beating a record. It does not have to be going on that trip or taking that risk. A discovery in your backyard is no less fulfilling, the hard pound of rain on your roof no less gratifying because they allow you to live. Adventures do not have to be wondrous. They can be whatever you want because you create them. Happiness may be in every one of these things, each person with their own version. 
But where would we be with only the, those grand moments to rely on? Where would we be without the smell of the forest or the taste of a dream? After that wonderful boost of happiness, what is the rest of the world? Dull, dreary, desolate. Or it would be. If only those gilded moments mattered, what would be the point of coming home to bland walls and empty faces? The world would not turn because no one would bother to keep it going. Repeating your joys can only make your days better. But getting stuck in a cycle is no help to anyone. You are no less because you don't have when another does. You are more because you know what you have and love it. Happiness is not making someone stumble because you are unsure about who you are. The flash of a cruel smile as you walk up the stairs, burning through you like you are nothing but paper. Do not let the opinions of others dictate your highs and lows. Constantly scouring, searching for who you are not, only to be that ideal copy. Do not look into the mirror and see someone else at the face that you wish was yours but is not. Fabricated, faked, framed. Looking back to realize you can't remember your name. Not the name given to you at birth, but the name written on your soul. The name that will always be yours. The name untainted by the influence of others. Untainted by who you thought you should be. Untainted by your mistakes scribbled over your heart. But something written can always be erased, leaving the faintest outline of something regretted. Happiness is not destruction. It is not killing what someone else has because you are fear you are not enough to create something beautiful. Doubt, drilling through you, disarming, demanding. Why spend your days existing when you could be so much more? Why look out and long for what another has without bothering to reflect on your own life? Notice what you can change in every longing glance and every side disappointment. Not in someone else, but in yourself. Living is not breathing. Living, true living, is being all you can and want to be. Live a life of truths, not injustices. Having nothing to say does not mean nothing needs to be said. Don't hold your breath waiting for a change when you could exhale a revolution. Happiness is what gets you up in the morning when the sun rays pierce through the clouds, bringing in another day. It is the job you love. It is coming home from a long day, knowing tomorrow could be better. It is everyone who's loved you, carrying you to the next day. Cradled in the crescent moon of their arms, warm and secure. It is watching them grow every day, seeing how they fall, and seeing how they rise. Every jewel of happiness melds into the reason why you smile, into the way you look at others. Fill the space around you with the things you love, because you will see them and smile. Make where you live somewhere you want to thrive. Make it a place for creations and for freedom, matching your beliefs, loves, and treasures. Dress for yourself not for others, whether it be dresses and suits of armor or sweatpants and a warm blanket. Your confidence makes you striking, stunning. Each person has their own branded happiness, whether that be creating, exploring, or inventing. Expand off this, live off this. Allow it to make you brighter and more content, glowing through the cracks, lighting the way for others. Making space for yourself is not selfish. It is getting to know yourself, exploring the farthest reaches of your abilities, testing your boundaries, and always searching for a way to expand. It is filling you up with experiences and feelings. Do not worry about changing the world. 
All the littles will add up to the incredible. One grain of sand does not make a beach. Every bit unique, but all part of a whole. Those who say that there is only one way do not truly want you to be happy. Do not let one bad day write the script for the rest of the week. Just because someone ruins a day does not mean they are bad for a life. The more you care, the more the world gives back. Enough people discovering what it means to live seeps into a pool of happiness, spreading out into others. Happiness is written in a unique language on every person's heart that we can all learn to read if only we try. That's what I want to do. Now I'm happy. Progress. Thanks for noticing, Clara. Dr. T. Sorry. I, I, don't, I don't even know I'd say that. I, just, I, I don't really know what to say in time. Stupid fart. Stupid, 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 stupid. Anxious. Why don't you listen to what Caden Reuter has to say? I was told it would help to picture you people in your undergarments, <laughs> but I don't want to. <laughs> to be completely honest, that probably just made it worse. I feel like it's making me more uncomfortable. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Most of the time, I don't really know what to say. I think not knowing what to say can be a large part of life. Life is filled with uncertain and uncomfortable moments. Some small, some big, some serious, some hilarious. Here's an example of one of many uncomfortable moments of my life. I was just a few months old when my family made its annual journey to Linden Hills, Michigan for our family vacation. Wanting to buy some new baby clothes, my parents stopped at an outlet mall in Indiana to pop into a store for a few minutes. For whatever reason, my parents decided against bringing the diaper bag with them. Not their best decision. <laughs> Apparently, in the store, catastrophe struck. Unholy smells <laughs> wafted towards my parents' noses and my mother instructed my father to take me back to the car. My father dry heaved, <laughs> fought back tears, and raced back to the car while holding me like a football about to be punted on the fourth down. <laughs> now, my father is a very large, <laughs> very white, ruggedly handsome <laughs> man. <laughs> My coffee-colored skin stuck out against his pasty forearms. That contrast, coupled with his awkward holding of me and his quickened pace, concerned some folks. <laughs> They were certain he was stealing me and followed him to our car and confronted him. <laughs> Where do you think you're going with that baby? They demanded. My father explained what had happened and held me up as if I were Simba on Pride Rock. <sighs> the people laughed and apologized for assuming before continuing on with their day. When they saw the scene in front of them, they were uncertain about what was going on, but had the bravery to step up and say something. And I think that is something we can all admire. Another thing I admire about that story is my parents. 
When it comes to my adoption, my parents have always openly spoken about it. My type of adoption is termed open, and that means my biological parents participated in the process of placing me with my adoptive family and have cont continued to have contact with me and my family. There are varying degrees of openness. My open adoption would be considered very open. My birth mother is named Jen. She and her husband have four children, Abigail, Jonah, Levi, and Adam. My birth father is Anthony. He has a daughter named Aaliyah, and I have real, meaningful relationships with all of them. I remember a few summers ago, we were able to meet up with Jen's side of the family, where we spent the whole day at the beach. I'm guessing you're probably thinking, wow, that sounds so nice and peaceful. Well, you see, when there are four screaming children running around with their swimsuits halfway down their bums, chasing seagulls, and then proceeding to trip over absolutely nothing, it can be a little less than peaceful. The little conversations I was able to have with Jen were really nice. The warm sun shining on us as we chatted about our current favorite Agatha Christie books and how cute the kids were despite the handfuls of sand they were shoveling into their mouths. <laughs> I referred to everyone by their first name. Jen's daughter, Abigail, called me sister the whole day, and I referred to my birth mom as Jen. I had a great time that afternoon, and from what I can remember, it wasn't awkward or anything with the names. I was glad I had figured it out without offending anyone. So. I was a little surprised when I met up with my birth father, Anthony, a few years later. I was sitting in the car with Anthony and Aaliyah, staring at the dashboard and listening to Freaky Friday by Lil Dicky. <laughs> so, I know my music taste isn't from that side of the family. <laughs> when suddenly, Anthony brought up Doug Dad. I forget why Doug Dad was brought up or what the conversation was about, but I do remember calling Doug Dad, Dad, and then hearing a little voice peep in from the back asking me, why don't you call our dad, Dad? Why don't you mind your business? <laughs> is what I thought in my head, <laughs> but Obviously, I couldn't say that. But then I really started to think about it. Why don't I call him dad? I mean, he was the one who created me, so doesn't that technically mean he is my dad? Very recently, I found out he didn't want me to be adopted. He had wanted to try and make it work, but he was in the Air Force and got stationed away for several months, so there wasn't anything he could do about it. When he told me that, I truly didn't know what to say. At first, I thought of apologizing, but what am I sorry for? I didn't ask to be born. I was just popped out and passed on. <laughs> But then, what do you call people that aren't quite parents, but feel way greater than an aunt or an uncle? Mom? Dunkle? I don't know. Which is why I actually try to avoid having to directly address them. When we talk on the phone, I usually just say, hey, you? That's weird. I literally wouldn't exist without them. And all I can ever manage to call them is you. My birth parents gave me my genes, except taste in music, obviously. <laughs> but my Carla mom is the one who helped me button up my Levi's for my kindergarten cowgirl costume. They shaped me into the person I am today. Going forward, I know I will be unsure about a lot of things. And while I might be unsure about how to address my birth parents, 
I am certain about a number of things. I am certain that I love all of them. I am certain that they love me. And I am certain that they are family. They always have been, and they always will be. Thank you. Well, now I'm more certain, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable. So you are sure? Yeah, I'm certain. Not comfortable. Have you ever considered moving? <laughs> this is going to take some getting used to. Change is like that. My colleague, Jessica Russell, can sift through that. There is a saying in the real estate world, location, location, location. I never wanted to be here. In this state, I've never been in a Pennsylvania state of mind. <laughs> I've been trying to figure out where I belong for six years. Physically, I don't know where I should truly be. I always thought my home was where I spent my first 12 years in Glenview, Illinois. But when I moved here six years ago, that vision changed. I knew I had a different address, lived in an entirely different state, and was subject to slightly different weather conditions. <laughs> but was this really my home now? I didn't want it to be. We're familiar with the stages of grief, of loss. Those stages are denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and finally, acceptance. I slogged my way through each and every one of these stages, but couldn't seem to shovel my way through to acceptance. Since I was little, I knew what my life would look like. I would graduate from my elementary school and go to high school in, with my best friend. I never once considered that I wouldn't always live there. My world was perfect. I had my parents, my neighbors, my friends, and my church all within a one mile radius. And everything I could ever need was at my fingertips. So I wasn't exactly thrilled about moving away from my home. When I was transplanted from Glenview to Pennsylvania, I made a conscious decision not to grow. I made a conscious decision to push away any feelings of happiness or any excitement about my new home. Those roots of dissatisfaction were insidious and sprouted unhappiness not just for me, but for those around me. I made my own problems my parents' problems. I was so angry. And at that point, I didn't even want to be happy. I didn't want to give my parents satisfaction. I wanted to be angry and someone had to pay. It's a pity I chose myself and everyone around me. It's a pity I practically threw my younger adolescent years into the hands of loneliness. I continued to plot my unhappiness. My laundry would pile up in my room until I could not see my floor anymore and I had no intention of cleaning it. I would be under my covers most of the day and not spend any time with my family. I fed and watered my misery, taking gentle care to make sure that she thrived. But why did I try so very hard to make myself miserable? I didn't want to be happy here. And if I tried, I would be betraying myself and my friends, and then what would be true or real? My misery grew like an invasive vine, strangling and multiplying itself around my happiness. I was so attached to what I thought was going to be my life that I pushed away any opportunities to be happy, stunting any chance of growth. I chose to survive instead of thrive. I bargained. My bargaining came in the form of begging to visit Glenview every four or six months, and even going so far as to write an extensive plan of how I would go live with my best friend and go to high school in Glenview. 
In my mind, I saw myself living my best life there, something I wanted so dearly to do. Once my bargaining and my begging didn't work, I settled myself into my next stage of grief, anger. Anger was loud. Anger was obnoxious. Anger had wound itself into every single crevice of my life. There was only room for others to be the reason for my pain. So I blamed my parents for moving our family to Pennsylvania. I blamed the church for not being there for me when I was hurting so badly. Anger made me blame myself for being too ignorant to realize that my new life in Pennsylvania was not going to be all rainbows and butterflies. Anger made me miss my friends and miss the place where I had grown up. Anger made me make choices that led me into my darkest state of mind, one I had never known before, depression. Before anything can start to look up, things needed to plummet deep, deep down. I had wound myself so deep into my misery that I bargained with my life. In my mind, there wasn't, there wasn't a point anymore. My original expectations for my life were gone, and I wasn't physically in the state I wanted to be in. I wasn't in the mental state I wanted to be in either. And it was deteriorating by the day. My life was dark and colorless and I alienated myself from the people who really cared about me. And it wasn't until I was lying in an uncomfortable hospital bed that felt like a coffin six feet under heaping piles of dirt that I realized I had a choice to make. Stay six feet under or do my best to climb up. I decided to climb. As I was climbing, I took a summer trip to Arizona. Being in the beautiful sun just made me feel good. I felt really, truly happy for the first time in so long. And it was like being in a new state shifted my entire perspective of life. So back at home, I did my best to recreate my feelings from Arizona. The constant excitement for the next day or looking forward to seeing the people that I love. It gave me perspective over how much I had actually bottled myself up and just how much I had actually succeeded in making myself miserable. This realization showed me that the 12-year-old girl I thought I had left in Glenview was still there. She still wanted to be happy, but I had pushed her down for so long. All that had changed was the state that I lived in, but deep down, I never really changed. Maybe, just maybe, it is all about location. I had let the boggy ground of depression consume my entire being for so long. The hole I had dug myself was deep, deeper than I had ever expected. But I wanted to be better. However, conscious efforts needed to be made for any type of flowers to bloom. I chose to spend more time with my family. I did my laundry. If I couldn't shift physical states, maybe I could shift my state of mind. So, bit by bit, I was finally able to very hesitantly tiptoe across the threshold of acceptance. I've come to an acceptance that I will be graduating from high school in Bernath in Pennsylvania and not one in Glenview, Illinois like I had always imagined. I've accepted that my high school experience was not one that I got to have with my childhood best friend, but I have met some pretty great people along the way. And I've also accepted that I probably won't ever come to a full acceptance of my teenage years. If I can be the author of my misery, I can write my own tale of happiness. Maybe I haven't come to a full acceptance of my move or location, but I have finally realized that I'm the only one who can write my story. Making do with what we have is an important skill but growing with what we have is essential. And only this year was I truly able to accept my reality and grow from it. It only took six years, three jobs, and two states for me to realize the importance of the phrase, grow where you are planted. Thank you. Wowza, that was a lot to digest. 
this might be a good time for us to take a break. Maybe get a snack. Are they free? <laughs> Frugal. <laughs> Let's take a soft 10. Feeling refreshed? Yep, I'm feeling refreshed, but I don't know. There's just, there's a lot coming up and I'm not really sure how to deal with it. Well, I find that it helps to just be in the moment. But what if the moment is, meh? <laughs> One thing at a time. For the present, please give your attention to Lucas Sinisvet. Allow me to take you on a journey back in time. The date, April 2nd, 2022. <laughs> the place, MPAC. The time, 40 minutes ago. <laughs> a person reminds you to put your phone on airplane mode. You dutifully reach for your phone or not, <laughs> and think, wait, what if there's an emergency? What if my parents need me? What if I get a Snapchat? <laughs> and so your phone stays active, because you cannot bear to miss it, whatever it might be. Is this our safety net, our shield against boredom? Are, I'll give you my divided attention until literally anything else comes up. <laughs> Are we so afraid of missing something somewhere that we miss what's right in front of us? And by that, I mean this. This moment, the one we all share here and now. When did we, as a society, become so omnipresent and not present? in the same breath. This is something I find myself struggling with, this endless loop of going through the motions. I wake up tired, check my phone. I stagger to school, check my phone. I doze off, then I check my phone. I eat food while I check my phone. I slog through the day, rinse, sleep, repeat. There was a period of over a month where I could not bring myself to write about being in the moment. The irony is not lost on me. <laughs> Anxiety struck. I feared I would not, could not write this speech to help others. I just couldn't bring myself to put my phone down. And then, one day, I put my phone down. You know that scene where Dorothy steps out of the black and white of Kansas into the vibrant technicolor land of Oz? It wasn't that. No choirs of angels sang, no cartoon light bulbs danced over my head. But suddenly, I could focus. I could write. I could be present. And like that, I remembered another time, only three summers back, though it seems a lifetime ago. I'm standing on an island. It's early morning. The fog from the water restricted my view. Its chill danced on my skin like the small flame in our fire pit. Barefoot, I picked my way to the nearest log and sat, resting my feet in the moss. A loon's cry came out of the woods. Animals rustled through the mist. I closed my eyes, took a deep breath. I was at ease. When I opened them, the sky was stained with color and sunlight cut through the fog. With no sense of urgency, but every tense of excitement, I rose, ran down to the shore, and jumped in. 
The icy water stole my breath, and I loved it. Did you catch what was not present in my story? My phone. <laughs> it was missing, but I was not missing it. In fact, I spent three weeks not missing it. I know, for some of you, that is an eternity of doom. How did I survive all that time? I read a book with, <laughs> with pages and everything. I slept in a hammock I set up myself. I built a raft with my hands. I talked with my family and I listened. I jumped off cliffs and watched sunsets because I could. And I wasn't worried about what I was missing. I wasn't missing a single thing. I'm not pretending this moment forever steered my course away from technology. You were all there for the middle of my speech. If you weren't on your phone. <laughs> I will say that trip changed me. And you don't need your own island getaway to make it happen. All it takes is a simple step. A swipe of the finger, and you too can unplug. So the next time you're staring up at the night sky, exploding with fireworks and possibilities, take a glance at the people filming those fireworks. Will they ever watch those videos? Will any video ever truly capture the sulfury scent? So chuckle to yourself. Maybe give a tiny shake of your head and clear your mind. There is so much wonder all around us if we just allow ourselves to be present. Are you in airplane mode yet? You could be flying. Thank you. That's what I got to do. I got to go out there and seize the moment. What am I doing sitting here? There's so much I could be doing. I got to go right now. Impulsive. <laughs> you know, we need to find your balance. <laughs> find my balance? What? what? The, still too literal. Oh. <laughs> Let's let that rest and turn to Chris Fox. If I told you scientists had made an amazing breakthrough and could prescribe to you something that would make you live longer, enhance your memory, and make you more creative, would you be interested? What if it also makes you look more attractive, keeps you slim, builds muscle, and lowers food cravings? What if on top of all of that, it reduces the risk of cancer and dementia? Sound too good to be true? Perhaps. But I'm not finished. In addition to all of that, it still manages to ward off colds and the flu while simultaneously lowering your risk of heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes. But wait, there's more. <laughs> You'll even feel happier, less depressed, and less anxious. Still interested? Yes? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but I have a confession to make. There are a couple side effects that I've been keeping from you about this prescription. Scientists have found that it causes better grades, improved immune systems, and significantly lower stress levels. <laughs> Believe it or not, most of us have the means to procure all these aforementioned benefits in their entirety, but choose not to, either out of spite of themselves or ignorance. All right, enough of the guesswork I'm making you do. I'm sure you all know by now, or at least I hope you do, but in order to receive all these benefits and more, all you have to do is sleep. I'd love to tell you exactly what sleep is and what our minds do during it, but really, we don't actually know. 
What we do know is that we spend one third of our lives pretty much playing dead. <laughs> we don't know why we were created to do this. All we know is that we need to. And if we don't, we'll die. That isn't to say a bunch of hardworking, sleep-deprived scientists aren't fighting to figure out this mystery, though. It's just absurdly complicated and complex. There are two main phases of sleep, REM sleep and NREM sleep. Both have a role in a plethora of important functions throughout the body, but for an example, I'll use their links to memory. To boil it down, REM sleep solidifies new memories in your brain, while NREM sleep removes unneeded memories. Mm, to boil it down, hopefully, sorry, well, NREM sleep removes unneeded memories, hopefully not this speech. <laughs> These two phases happen in waves throughout your sleep. Near the beginning of our well-needed rest, we're hit with very heavy NREM sleep, then a bit of REM. This wave then levels out to lots of REM and little NREM sleep later on to the night and into the morning. Now, there is a reason for this roller coaster of coziness. Imagine waking up in the middle of the night after only getting rid of memories. Kind of would seem like a waste of the day, right? Nothing was really gained, only lost. Now imagine doing that every day. Imagine never getting enough sleep. See where I'm going with this? The mind starts with more NREM sleep in preparation for all the REM sleep it's going to get. Not sleeping enough hinders this process, making it so we can never see our full potential. If we don't get enough sleep, we may see more of one phase than another, significantly reducing the number of memories stored. It's beyond sad. It's tragic. <laughs> we routinely limit our potential so that we can, what? Watch more cat videos? <laughs> Binge one last episode on Netflix? Send one more Snapchat streak? <laughs> Whatever the reason, it definitely feels like an unfair trade. Who here has made known to their peers just how little sleep they got the night before? <laughs> yeah, I only got like three hours of sleep last night. What was I doing? Well, I was working on beating a video game. <laughs> it almost feels like an accomplishment, you know? Like, we're winning against the urge to sleep. That being able to function with less sleep than our peers makes us stronger in a way. And that's exactly why I'm here. Because in reality, it's the exact opposite. There are no biological functions that are not enhanced by sleep. Your physical and mental states are both drastically changed depending on the quality and amount of sleep that you get. And in a society where sleep is undermined, an assortment of detriments await. Remember all those benefits I listed earlier? Those are real and significant. If those aren't enough to make you re-examine your sleep health, consider these aspects of sleep and the lack of it. The shorter you sleep, the shorter your life. The leading causes of disease and death in developed nations all have recognized links to the lack of sleep. Routinely sleeping less than six or seven hours a night demolishes your immune system, more than doubling your risk of cancer. Motor accidents caused by drowsy driving exceed those caused by alcohol and drugs combined. Sleep is not like the bank. You cannot accumulate a debt and hope to pay it off at a later date. Sleep for memory consolidation is an all or nothing event. Think about that last one for a moment. How many of us have willingly foregone sleep with the promise of getting it during the next night? I'm sorry, but it doesn't work that way. We might wish it did, but it doesn't. It's a lot like life in that regard. <laughs> After going through school and feeling and seeing the full effects of what a lack of sleep can do to a person, I know firsthand just how important sleep can be for us students. Sleep enriches our ability to memorize, learn, and make logical decisions and choices. 
It is the single best thing we can do for our bodies. In fact, studies show students who sleep seven hours each night score nearly 10% higher than those who don't. Even doctors have started prescribing sleep because it works so well. And if doctors don't know what they're doing, we're all in trouble. <laughs> but the society we live in makes it hard for us to get as much sleep as we should. Early work hours and lots of late night distractions take a toll on our mental and physical fortitudes. This is seen clearly when we take a peek at our chronotypes or our genetic sleep habits. Everyone is born with different needs when it comes to sleep. Some people go to sleep early and wake up early. Other people go to bed late and wake up late. And yet our entire way of life seems to build around one universal schedule. No wonder we all seem so exhausted. Water and sleep, just what the doctor ordered. But not all of us can just force ourselves to go to sleep. I know this fact all too well. Yes, believe it or not, the person telling you to get more sleep can barely get enough of it himself. But after years of sleepless nights and drowsy school days, I feel I've gained a grasp on sleep that I had not had before. It didn't come without effort and a lot of trial and error. But here are some ways I've found that help with being able to get to sleep. Set a schedule and stick to it. If you sleep at 11 p.m. on weekdays, then decide to jump into bed at 3 a.m. on the weekend, don't be surprised if you can't pass out at 11 the next weekday. Lose the, lose the phone? Uh-oh. I know you may hear this a lot, and there's a good reason for it too, trust me. Our brains use blue light as a cue that morning has arrived, since sunlight is mostly blue light. So since your phone screen emits a lot of blue light, booting up your phone late at night actually starts your body's waking process, something you definitely don't want before you're about to go to sleep. But some of us actually need to be near our phone before we go to sleep. So if you are one of those people, or just want to be on our phone before you're going to bed, consider setting a scheduled night mode time to limit the amount of blue light coming from your screen. Light music without lyrics can be a nice distraction if you tend to lie in thought. And turning off that clock that continually reminds you how late it is, which stresses you out, making it harder to go to sleep, which makes it so you want to check the clock again, and just relax. Close your eyes with me for a moment. Focus on the top of your head, then down to your eyes. Relax those eyelids. Your eyes aren't going anywhere. Relax your mouth and the muscles inside of it. Continue going down through your arms. Relax each finger, your stomach, your legs, then your toes. This is called the military sleep technique. And it is said that people who can master this technique fall asleep in as little as two minutes. So if you find yourself lying in bed with no hope of an adequate amount of sleep, give it a try. If you can just fall asleep, no questions asked, you better take advantage of that. At least for me and those of us who can't. From the kid who always pulled out his DS during pre-K nap time, that sounds like a superpower to me. <laughs> As I said near the beginning of the speech, much of sleep remains a mystery to us, but there is a ton of research being done around this topic. The things I mentioned tonight are only a fraction of what's contained within Matthew Walker's incredible book, Why We Sleep. I can't recommend his work enough. Get a copy for yourselves, but make sure to give yourself enough time to sleep too. The quality of your life depends on it. You're welcome. That guy was way more my speed. <laughs> I'm picking up what he's putting down. Now that you're feeling much more comfortable, shall we revisit what brought you in? I guess I'm just not all right. What does all right look like to you? I'm not really sure. I, uh, I guess that's why I'm here. My colleague, Sophia Irwin, may be able to ferret that out.
Okay. Used to express assent, agreement, or acceptance. Satisfactory, but not exceptionally good. An authorization or approval. What does it mean to be okay? Is it to accept our circumstances? Circumstances so cyclical, we get dizzy just speaking. Talking in circles until we get lost in our own words. Fighting the centrifugal force of the words from pulling us up a wall. Giving into the force as we force our feet to solid ground. Ground that has only been paved by the people before us who walked the trails of the tears of the people before them. A paved path of not exceptionally good satisfaction. My therapist tells me that okay is not a term I should be this comfortable with. But comfort is the butterfly blanket that holds a newborn until they're in their mother's arms. Who would want to leave that? Mothers are there to protect us, but sometimes they can't. But that's okay, because our sad girl playlist has us covered. <laughs> I feel like the world is ripping at its seams. With every variant of new problem and probability of pain could keep rising from disease. Disease can be physical or in mental forms, forming thoughts I can't see through because my light is in quarantine and my candle is burned out. But that's okay. <laughs> because the Rams won the Super Bowl and Stafford finally got his win. <laughs> Every breath I take, I wonder if it's my last. Nightmares introduced to me from the news, shooting bullets of misfortune, causing my mind to drift from the good in front of me. Nightmares that have me turning in my sleep, causing my blanket to form a clinging chrysalis, stopping my transformation from okay to something more. But that's okay. Because at least I have a blanket, and even ugly butterflies are pretty, right? <laughs> I mean, moths are butterflies, and sometimes moths are pretty. So if I'm a moth, I must be pretty. My family is spread across the state, and I never see them all for more than an hour. Late night game nights have turned into FaceTime calls, into text messages, and mom, please don't sell my toys because what if I need them? <laughs> what if I come home? Where is my home? Is home a person? A place where family is? I'm lost in a world I have always known but am just now starting to see. But that's okay, because we are working on fixing climate change and Misty Copeland is chasseing her way to the top. <laughs> I live in a world where we are supposed to be saved by some preeminent persona. I believe there is good and there is bad and there is love, but sometimes I get lost in the words. Words that wind into paths, paths that lead to questions. That's okay. I know the answer. The answer is always good in truth. <laughs> I'm told I need to find a better word than okay, but if I tell the truth, my forever smile will fade into a frown and down everything will go. Everything is falling apart and the world, my world, is ripping at the seams. The pressures of society seem to cause my lungs to shrink. At least I have lungs. We have our stories and then we have our narration. Narration never lies but how the story is heard changes. Everyone strives for the truth. The truth in our words, in our lives, 
and the stories we tell? The truth? We are not okay. Tumultuous times tie our souls to resort to what we know. All of our worlds are upside down and backwards, and the mirror that once reflected our perfect picture is perpetually shattered. We are all starting over. Over the river, through the woods, to happiness, we hope to go. We are all tired. We are all at our weakest point. We are not okay. Nothing about anything is okay. And that, that is okay. I'm told I shouldn't be so comfortable with the word okay, but what does it mean to be okay? Is it to walk the path of the people before us, to join my family's army, to cross that bridge to happiness? Being okay is not to have an ever-burning candle keeping us up as we pack our schedules to their breaking points. It is not to never grow up and out of our toys. It is definitely not making excuses for why things should be okay. Being okay is the feeling you get when you finish your favorite movie, or eating blackberries on your floor because your table is too messy. Sticking your feet in a stream with your friends because where else would you eat fries? It is those few nights a year when everyone's together for one night. But most importantly, being okay is different for everybody. My therapist tells me to expand my vocabulary, but I just learned a new word. Tumultuous times tie us together it's true, but I love a good storm. We are all traveling upstream in our own way, so let's not forget that we have each other, okay? I never knew okay could be so complicated. That John has a lot of different meanings. John. I'm Vern. Vern? You're not my seven o'clock. No. Uncomfortable. You know, my colleague Celeste's friend might be able to disinter this situation. I'm a freshman in history class. I'm taking this test. And I reach the essay part of the test, and I'm thinking, all right, Celeste, all you got to do is write this essay. Let's take a look at this essay prompt. All right, write an essay on three attributes of Julius Caesar. Got it? Easy. And oh, these are the three attributes I have to use. That is so nice of her to give us the attributes. All right, the three attributes are smart, funny, and attractive? Uh, no, you definitely read that wrong. Write an essay on three attributes of Julius Caesar, smart, funny, and attractive. I mean, why would she choose these words? Oh. I wonder if these parentheses mean anything. I mean, since the words are in parentheses, maybe it's just an example of what an attribute is, and I don't actually have to use these words. But, you know, it doesn't exactly say that, so probably not. I overanalyze this prompt over and over again. And after a while, I start looking around like, <laughs> Is nobody confused <laughs> why our teacher wants us to write this essay on Julius Caesar? Like we're his wingman or something? <laughs> like, come on guys, he's smart, funny, and attractive. <laughs> Total package. <laughs> 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 
but no. So I look back at this prompt, and I'm thinking, there is just no way we went over this in class. I mean, I feel like I totally remember if we talked about if Julius Caesar was hot. So I go to raise my hand and ask, but I stop myself because, Celeste, are you really going to ask your teacher if she wants you to write this essay? And on the off chance she does, you've just questioned a teacher. You can't do that. Teachers are never wrong. <laughs> but then, I got it. This teacher is testing us to see if we can write an essay on anything. <laughs> and if I write this really good essay, she'll be blown away. <laughs> so I start writing it. And I'm picturing what Julius Caesar looks like in my head, and I'm thinking, I mean, I wouldn't say attractive, but you know what? He's got that big nose. Maybe, maybe I could work with that. So I walk out of that classroom, and I look at my friends, and I go, that was a weird essay prompt. And I was just met with blank stares. And it's in that moment that I realize I read it wrong. And now I have to have this super awkward conversation with my teacher, <laughs> explaining that I don't actually think Julius Caesar was hot or funny. <laughs> and that is just one example of the extreme measures that I will go to just to avoid an awkward situation. I mean, another time, my friend's mom was dropping me off after a day at the beach. We're headed to my house, and after about five minutes, I'm looking out the car thinking, yeah, this is not the way to my house. We're actually driving in the opposite direction. But I don't say anything. She's the teacher, I mean, she's the adult, and I've never driven before. And she was such a confident woman that if I questioned her, she would totally respond with a, Celeste, I know where I'm going. This is actually the shorter way, which is ridiculous because the shorter way would just be doing a complete U-turn and going back the other way. And guys, I kid you not, I let her drive for 20 minutes in the wrong direction. And after a while, she looks at me and goes, this is the way to your house, right? And I slowly met her eyes in the rear view mirror, and I just had to say, no. I just thought you knew where you were going. And there's just another one of me trying to avoid awkwardness and just making it worse. But you know, sometimes before I can even try and avoid awkward, you know, it comes and finds me when I least expect it. Like this one time, I was at the grocery store, scanning the shelves, and I feel this presence behind me. And I glance over, and guys, it was a middle-aged white man. And I do what I normally do when I see a middle-aged white man. I start walking away. But he yells out to me, and he goes, hey, hey, are you Filipino? Because my wife's Filipino. And now, instead of walking away, I'm just standing there like in shock and confusion because this is honestly the last thing I was expecting today. So I just say no and try and move on. But he shouts again, what about Japanese or Korean? What about Chinese? And after this guy's listed all three of the Asian countries he knew, I know. I just, just kind of nod and walk away. I mean, just being Asian put me in that awkward situation. And I'm a Chinese girl with white parents. When you're adopted, you are 100% guaranteed awkward situations for life. It's practically in the fine print. Right next to the warning labels, damaged goods and no refunds. <laughs> And I know, that joke may have made you feel a little awkward, a little uncomfortable. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> but 
here's the great thing about that joke, is that it made some of you laugh. And that is the anecdote to awkwardness. As someone who knows awkward very well, I found that laughter kind of fixes it. Laughter is a powerful tool. It can improve your immune system, soothe tension, relieve stress, and relieve pain. But what about that nervous laughter where you want to laugh in an awkward situation? Well, I recently read on the Healthline website <laughs> that that urge is your body trying to regulate the situation and tell you that whatever's happening, not a big deal. And when I read that, I thought, well, if our body's trying to make us laugh, maybe we should just do it. I mean, in situations where we feel awkward, we're disconnected and uncomfortable. And sharing a laughter is the best solution because it has the ability to connect us. So let me give you an example of my new and improved method for awkward. <laughs> One time, I was talking about my adoption with people, and I could feel it getting very awkward. <laughs> and to ease the situation, I just kind of say, no, but what's great is if I ever want a tattoo, I can just get a tattoo that says, made in China. <laughs> and look, that person may not have found that funny in the moment. <laughs> but, you know, I heard some of you laugh, and I heard some laughter throughout the speech. And you know, that made me feel really good. And I hope it made you all feel good. And maybe we just feel a little bit more connected, even if it was a little bit awkward. <laughs> Thank you. You know, if you think about it, it's kind of funny. And sad. Sort of like a duality of life kind of thing. Very insightful. <laughs> My colleague, Taj Odiambo, can elucidate this shadowy subject. Elusa what? Just watch. By a show of hands, who in here likes superheroes? Okay, okay. Uh, who in here is a Marvel fan? Any Marvel fans? What about DC? Okay, okay. I like it. Now, anybody that knows me well or knows me at all knows that I'm a huge fan of superheroes and comic books. I've loved them ever since I was a little kid, and I don't think I'll ever stop. Personally, I can't choose between Marvel and DC like you guys just did, but... <laughs> I can say that my favorite superhero ever is Batman, hands down. I, I love Batman, everything from the Batmobile to the Batcave to his bat suits, except for the George Clooney one with the weird nipples. <laughs> Other than that, I love everything about Batman. <laughs> Throughout the years, there have been many great film adaptations of him, but the one that sticks out to me the most is The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight is a legendary film that's received a lot of international acclaim. Most people who talk about the film bring up Heath Ledger's show-stopping performance as the Joker. And Ledger's amazing. He changed how we view cinematic villains to this day. But Ledger's Joker isn't the villain that I want to focus on tonight. I want to focus on the movie's other villain, Harvey Dent, otherwise known as Two-Face. So to give a brief breakdown of Harvey's story, Harvey is running, running for district attorney in Gotham City. Batman fangirls hard for Harvey because he's genuine about bringing peace to Gotham and that's all that Batman wants to do. More importantly, Harvey's desire for peace gives the citizens of Gotham a hope that they haven't had in a very long time. However, there is one Gotham citizen who doesn't take too kindly to Harvey's quest for peace and that would be the Joker. The Joker is a self-proclaimed agent of chaos and Harvey is a champion of order, so the Joker sees fit to get Harvey out of the picture. He does this by killing Harvey's girlfriend, Rachel Dawes. But plot twist, Rachel isn't just Harvey's girlfriend, she's Batman's childhood sweetheart. So Batman and Harvey lose the woman that they love and they're both devastated about it. 
Batman uses his pain as fuel to put an end to the Joker schemes and to bring peace to Gotham. But Harvey, on the other hand, takes the exact opposite route. Consumed by his grief, he becomes the homicidal villain known as Two-Face, whose only goal is to make sure others have the same pain that he has, because he's a villain. As I prepared for this speech, it occurred to me that heroes and villains are a lot more similar than we realize. I mean, think about it. Usually they both have a secret identity or persona that's separate from who they actually are. On top of that, they usually deal with some form of tragedy early on that spurs them onto whichever paths they choose to take. And once they're on those paths, they both view each other as obstacles to whatever goals they want to achieve. But in spite of these similarities, we tend to always identify with the hero. Why? Well, the answer is that heroes show us what we're capable of. No, I don't mean flying or super speed or bad nipples. Um, I mean taking every shot that life throws your way and still choosing to get up. Still choosing to do what you know is right, even when everything else tells you otherwise. That simple choice, because at the end of the day, that choice is the main thing separating a hero from a villain. For the most part, we don't have true villains in our lives, but we all have personal struggles that we view as stumbling blocks on the road to an ideal life. For instance, employees have strict bosses, athletes have injuries, civic students have Mr. Clip. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Whenever we, we read a story or we watch a film and we see a protagonist take down an antagonist, we're filled with a sense of, of joy and hope because we see the person that we want to become triumph over the person that we fear becoming. As human beings, it's imperative for us to realize that many times the pain we experience is not our fault, but our response to that pain is entirely our responsibility. While trials and tribulations are inevitable in life, we're blessed with the free will to choose how we respond to them. We get to choose whether we'll be Two-Faced or Batman. Admittedly, it's much easier to take the Two-Faced route and bow down to our grief, and a lot harder to be Batman and rise above it. But that's why villains exist. They're made to show us how frighteningly easy it is to stray onto the path of villainy. Now, full confession, part of the reason I jumped on the opportunity to speak tonight was just to talk about Batman, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> but, mo but more importantly, I came up here to encourage you. I came up here to remind you that you do not have to be a prisoner to the trials that you face. I came up here to remind you that you have the choice to use your wounds as fuel to do what you know is best. So whenever you're faced with the inevitable struggles that life throws your way, I encourage you to think back to Batman and Harvey. I encourage you to remember that you're one choice away from being the hero of your story. Thank you. So if you're not my seven o'clock, who are you? You know what, Doc? I think you've helped me figure that out. <laughs> I know what I have to become. I'm whatever this school needs me to be. <laughs> I'm Bathman. <laughs> Hero syndrome. <laughs> My work here is done. Time to go home. Thank you all for coming and have a good night.